We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Welcome to Grok Talk. We are live from Southern New Hampshire University, the Practical Federalist Forum 2016. Stand and fight. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the program. I have Skip Murphy here with me on my right, Mike Rogers to my left. And uh, we're expecting um, a host of uh, possible guests up until the point where uh, the thing actually begins. Host today is Jeff Chittister. Uh, Brian McCormick is standing right in front of me, (laughs) Cornerstone Policy Research. Uh, We're all expecting Senator Cruz, Harley Fiorina. We, we start in and Stanley everybody Kurtz, comes over, and of yeah, course. We're on the air and everybody comes to see us. This is awesome. So <laughs> welcome to the show. Uh, we will hey. be doing the program headset. from, uh, it's not plugged in. We, what? Yeah, you like have to that? give a Mike's headset or something. No, we do this. Uh, that's Oh, yeah, we take that. Plunk. Yeah, and plug that Hand in. me so that. So we can head. talk to Jeff for a couple minutes. So anyway. And that's exactly uh, how it works. Good. We will do an hour of regular show and then we will break into the lovely event and you'll hear that for the second hour of the program and then... Yeah. Rock Talk yeah. will officially sure. be over, but we're going to be here live streaming all day, and uh, so that'll be fun. And uh, just a minute, we're going to talk to the master of ceremonies. The master of all ceremonies. The man from the sea coast. Yeah. Um, li- little fun Sorry, fact from the uh, unfortunate shooting yesterday, or actually, was it Thursday night now? I'm losing track of time. Is that the university had a security guard who yeah. was intentionally unarmed. You can't make this stuff up when liberals are at work. No, you can't. All right, how are we doing? Okay. Let's try that. There, Jeff? I can hear you guys. Hey. Hey. You can hear you. All right. All right. Mr. Jeff Chittister, welcome to Grok Talk. Hey, guys. How have you been? Good. How are you? Busy. We haven't seen you more. We haven't seen you since the last events. event. Yeah. yeah, that's what it seems to be. That's kind of a... It's, it's a good life, but... Same time, next event. <laughs> we used to see so. each other a lot more. Plus, you guys have jobs, too. Yeah, yeah. Where are you people realize it. Where are you going to be on the 17th, Jeff? Uh, the 17th is going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, we're going to show the rest of the country how you actually do a caucus. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I Most hope excellent. So. Yeah. I hope so. It's been awfully quiet. I'm like, is everything done? Is everything ready? We're, I mean, I- well, you, you have some, you know, I, I talked to a few of the people who were part of the organization team the other day, and um, yeah, come on. You get, you get the most professional team uh, that do. you don't have to pay a lot I of do. money to in the world. We do have Diane Bitter, so I can't yeah. imagine that it won't come, come off. Flawless yeah, and, and, yeah. Fra- and Fran Wendelbo, yes. Fran and the whole group. But the, yeah. you know, that's it's it's interesting because you know um, we were uh, somebody asked me the other day the phases of the campaign, you know, and I really break the campaigns down into three. You know, going through the summer, you know, you're really just giving that stump speech, you're introducing yourself, you're doing all those picnics and and the little things. But there aren't a lot of people there, um, and typically in the second, you know, that second phase that we're starting to move into. You're starting in the more policy points. You're hopefully moving beyond the stump stage. So the caucus actually comes at a very good time when people are really starting to focus in on just those key policy issues as well. Absolutely. And Shane, if you're listening, you need to be here in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shane. Oh, or, you, or, or you can just take our live stream. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, yeah, you could just watch it, maybe, hopefully, uh, from, we'll the, make, we'll from, the, from the from uh, the. Hopkins. Pulling arena, the Durgan pulling arena. The, yeah, it? that's an interesting. Well, it's a good venue. It actually adds into the um, rural, the, rural festive, flavor. the festive theme of a caucus. You yes. know, caucus should really be there. Because one time uh, I remember, and, and my friends in Iowa always yell at me because you know we use the old adage. You know, New Hampshire picks presidents, and Iowa picks uh, corn. Shane and, Vanderhart's over there. Yeah, and, and they're <laughs> right <laughs> over there, and, and, they, and they get really upset. It's not that I said it, nor did I ever originate it, but someone once asked me, what, you know, how would you describe a, what a caucus is? And I said, it's really like the end of the movie Carrie. <laughs> when, the, when the doors get slammed and the blood comes flying down. Oh, like, my I God. <laughs> <laughs> that is, and he's absolutely right. There's a lot, whatever Republicans involved, there's a lot more organization. But no, it'll be interesting, and I, I can't wait to see it. And I think it's, you know, the initiative is brilliant, too, if you think about it. 
Yeah, it so, is. And we, you know, we're we're expecting a good turnout. We've got some pre-check-ins. Can't use the word registration because you're not registering to vote. We're taking right. registered voters, and you have to be one to be able to go there and participate. Yeah, Republican or independent. Well, you know, it's interesting, and, I, and I've got to ask you guys this. And, and so, you know, this is the fun thing about being on with you guys is that, you know, uh, Skip and Steve and, and Mike, have you noticed, though, that this is really the first time in a long time that it's actually the establishment candidates beating the heck out of each other, trying to, trying to make sure that they get that double-digit percentage of support? Um, usually you see the conservatives, and there is certainly a, a, a debate going on there, but, but it could be that the, <sighs> suddenly because of the way the breakup of— turn of, your- Volume down while you're doing that. Go ahead. Yeah, suddenly you know because of the way the you know the makeup is is that you know it's the establishment that could find themselves you know falling further down into yeah, m- relevance. Well, m- well, I mean the establishment put up some faux conservatives to try and dilute the vote, and none of them are getting any traction whatsoever. There's Jim Who from Virginia. And uh, <laughs> his George, daughter Cindy Lou, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jo- jo- George Pataki, who's uh, got no traction either, even though he's a nice guy. Uh, you know, even Chris Christie's barely getting registered. Yeah, yeah reg- his town reg- hose has been uh, t- town hose. Town his hose. Town hose. <laughs> wow, soundbite, soundbite. <laughs> he's, he's from New Jersey, but <laughs> his town halls have been actually very, very good, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, Christie's actually one of the interesting ones because yeah. he is an absolutely fun character. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Lindsey Graham's getting no traction whatsoever, but he's actually the funniest man on the stage. If you, oh, if, isn't if, he great? If you, if you watched the last, uh, the last junior debate, yeah. Lindsey, Lindsey Graham, self-deprecating humor, off the, absolutely off the charts funny. Uh, yeah. That's like yes. if he ever gives up politics, he's got a job on the stage. It's like when Goober came to Hee Haw. They added in a new oh, element yeah. of, of, of comedy into that whole realm of... <laughs> so he does bring in that humor, and and the thing is, I, I'll give Lindsey credit though he he's he's never going to lie to you. He just says exactly what he believes, and you know you can scratch your head on it, but but the yeah. thing is, at least you know where you stand with him. Yeah, I you, mean that's you, the interesting you, thing you know, about it. You know, he's pro pro illegal immigrants, and he's also for yeah. for a strong defense. Um, you know, I always worry a little bit about uh, about judges as military men, uh, you know, lawyers, <laughs> because uh, essentially they're not the fighters, but they're willing to send your kids out to fight. That's why I was actually kind of keen yeah, on Jared's Perry. Yeah, interesting. No, I take it more the other way that uh, they're not so much about the fighting. They want to legalize the fighting, which, as we have all seen, and what I've been told by my sons, you probably ran into it as well, yeah. Jeff being a veteran. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when the lawyers get involved, then you get these... Rules of engagement, which have no reality at all. None. I'll tell you, my youngest son in Afghanistan used to complain all the time. And he said, these rules are more often getting us killed or hurt than actually us doing what we're supposed to do, which is break things and kill people. Well, you know, it was was interesting because when when I was in the military and I was over in Europe, we only had three rules. We only had three rules. And and it was great because, you know, I had a, a wonderful general who had gone through the Korean and Vietnam War and it basically... If they're not supposed to be in this area, you shoot to kill them. If you shoot to kill them and they live, you shoot to kill them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and he has really three simple rules, and no one could really countermand them. And I thought, always thought that that was a great idea. If they're shooting at me from a mosque, well, then it's no longer sacred. Kaboom. Yeah, yeah and, and the first thing you do is blow the mosque off the face of the earth. Well, and 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 that's the debate. You know, I emceed that event with uh, Donald Trump and and really the you know the gentleman from New York who got up and talked about that. But you know, it hasn't been interesting. I don't know if you guys saw this, but did, did wait a minute, wait a minute. I just passed food down that way. That was not to get it away from me. I was trying to be oh. nice before taking the first one. Yeah, but the, as the, long the, as you have yeah, there, I'm there taking it. I'm going <laughs> to eat later. I mean, are you guys surprised about where? What has been discussed up to this point? I mean, I have been. I, but, but I also made it a point of saying, look, you know, once again, you know, you guys love to take away one leg of the, of the conservative stool thinking that we're never going to talk about it. And yet every <laughs> single conversation has really been either foreign policy or that, that social leg, you know, immigration, law and order, um, life and all those things. And it, I think it's taken some candidates back. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, Planned Parenthood have essentially made – made this uh, about themselves, uh, and, oh, sure. they, and they have given people like Carly Fiorina and Bobby Jindal a platform on which to, uh, from which to speak on a pro-life issue, which otherwise would have been alluded to rather than campaigned on. 
uh, it's now perfectly legitimate to come out strongly pro-life and against Planned Parenthood. But it's 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 like I've said to some of the candidates. So there is the, the, eventually you're going to clash if you think that you can ignore the, the social issues. I'm amazed about how many of the candidates have come out and said, "Well, you know, I'm pro-choice, but I don't like spending all this money." And I keep telling them, "I said it doesn't work. It's always going to be that way. You but, you want to ignore this issue, but lo and behold, you find yourself in it." Let me go after my favoritist <laughs> whipping boy. That would be Doug Scammon, the former New Hampshire. <laughs> Speaker of the House, elected by the Democrats, nice just like the, the the current Democrat elected and owned Mr. Sean Jasper. Jasper. Yeah. But he and I had a real big screaming match one time, and he said, "Get away from the social issues. We always lose." And I said, "Every social issue has a financial cost," exactly. and it shut him right down. Because and then I started off on every single thing that the Democrats have pushed as social issues, because nitwits like him. Think of, that, yeah. yeah, think that if we get rid of the social issues, then we'd be okay. Well, no, because social issues, like you said, are never going to go away. No. And the Democrats make sure that everybody is all in, whether you like it or not, they force you to pay for all of their social issues. Correct. And, then, and, when, you, and when you frame it that way, and I think that you saw this with Planned Parenthood, regardless of what Planned Parenthood says, um, they lost this week again. And, you know, the American people are basically saying, look, you know, you're not explaining yourself really well here. And I think that's an important issue to bring up. I mean, they don't want to spend the money if, if you're making the money. Uh, tons of money. Yeah. But, but you're right. The one thing I have been very surprised about mm-hmm. is that there has been very little talk about the national debt, the annual deficit, and what it's going to take to go up there. The only thing we're starting to see seep into the regular news, and it's still mostly wonks that are doing this, the sequestration and what's about to happen to the military. Right. With, and, and no one is talking about, you know, President Obama basically holding an unapproved budget um, that doesn't really increase spending that much but does does help strengthen the military a little bit, holding it hostage. You know, Republicans are constantly being accused of holding something hostage. And suddenly that – and then it was great even this week. I don't know if you've heard this, this pattern this week been going on. They want to hold – the Democrats want to hold the debt ceiling hostage on gun control. <laughs> they, they're actually openly talking about it. And, you know, once again, this is the same people who two years ago who said you, you never use this, this mechanism as a hostage methodology. You, you have open debates. You don't attach things onto this that aren't relative to the conversation. And yet, lo and behold, and they don't think they're going to be penalized for it. And they're right. You know why? Because you guys are the only types of media outlet that are really out there. Yeah, I mean, if the Republicans actually stood firm on that one and the, gun, yeah. gun, and the government shut down and the people knew because the Republicans actually dared to tell them and spend some money on advertising, <laughs> the people would be as mad as hell at the Democrats for daring to try and shut down the government over a fundamental right. Right. Two words. Surrender caucus. The surrender, surrender caucus. And, we are only, going to, and that uh, includes uh, uh, Kelly Ayotte. And, and what a wuss and what a coward. Well, well you know, they yeah. bring in that, the, and, and I know where Steve's from, but, you know, you end up with, you know, strategy and, you know, um, tactics, and, and you go through the whole thing. What I thought was interesting is going into this really, what has been a very um, convoluted week, going into another convoluted week. Now we have leadership in the House up for grabs. Chafis suddenly throws his name out there, um, who, who's been one of the good guys on a lot of the issues. He's younger, and, and he's not afraid to, to be vocal on it. Um, you know, that, that brings in a whole new element of, to what people thought was going to be, once again, a coronation. Yeah, what about, what about Yoho from uh, Florida, the one that tried to give uh, uh, Bain the push last year? Where I was Daniel able to- Webster? No, he's going to, and also Mark Meadows, but too many. Yeah, well, well, yeah. he's right. It's the right yeah. name. Yahoo, yeah. Uh, oh, because <laughs> I was, I was. No, able no, no. This was not Yahoo. Yahoo, yeah. No, no. I was able to write about uh, giving Bain the Yoho Heaveho because this guy Yoho from from Florida was actually challenging him in the last leadership election. Yeah. We're going to take a really. We're going to attempt to take a short break, so that it's easier to post edit in production, and we will be right back. I'll just. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out? CNHT.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. 
the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. Yeah, we keep talking about that. Yeah, we'd love to come on the show. We'd love to. We would. Well, I think people forget that we have regular jobs, and my regular job has just been. Yeah, mine, busy. Mine, mine, mine's, been, mine's been off the charts. I barely get time to write Me these too. days. Me and there, too. There is just so much good stuff to write about. I'm, I'm ashamed that I'm not, oh, not finding the time to write it. Well, and, and once again, it's just like a, a church attendant. It's always just a few people who are the ones who are there early, who herd people around, do all the volunteer work and everything like that. And, I mean, you guys are out there. You guys have your regular jobs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it really, people Which don't I have, it. I have to tell these guys, probably next week, no blogging at all while I'm out in San Diego. I see, there we go. Well, so yeah, you yeah. guys are going to have to step up. All right. There all right, go. I'll try to step up. Okay. I'll give it a shot. We'll, I, I will. We'll, we'll do what we can. I'll tell my boss, I got a blog. That's right. <laughs> it's about time. I'm so, sure he'll just be like, go ahead. Well, you can oh, t- yeah, and I've got to be careful about that. But, you know, I, I, I can't say the name of the company, but I work for a company that's very very supportive of, of the method and methodology and, and madness that I put into Well, you know, my boss, we, uh, what was it, a couple of years ago, somebody in the Republican Party tried to get me fired yeah, by nice. quoting, uh, sending a letter and, and accusing me of being a misogynist. They sent it to the president of my company, small company, and it's also like, yeah. I talk to him every day. Um, he calls me up and goes, what is this? And, and I go, what? I go, oh, I know what it is. And I explained it to him. I explained it to him. That's and uh, he goes, all right. He's like, just be careful. That's all I said. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. You always do have to be careful, and I, I try to be you know I try to be gentle through my approaches and stuff like that. It was, um, but yeah, I mean, you guys are a little bit more active than I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I just I show up on Saturday morning, do my show, and I leave, and then I do the article, and then but you know, I, my my postings have gone way down. Yeah. Well, so, you can only do just so much, and yeah. you know, my regular routine now that I'm an empty nester. Almost yeah. again. I've got a helicopter. But the problem too. is, you guys are so fast at it. Even if I'm thinking about writing something, you guys have beaten me to the pu- way, way ahead of me. I'm like, I'm, I'm not. E- I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be relative if I do this at the end of the day. You guys are are one story into it, two updates, and twenty comments. <laughs> And I mean, I'm sitting there like, well, what am I going to write about? I end up reposting a lot of your stuff. Well, you know, and I keep thinking, I can't blog during the day. Oh, these guys Steve are can, and it's like, he's taking all the good stuff. Yeah, I, I do leave stuff out there for you. Well, yeah, yeah that goes back but to Mike you, yeah, with so much out there. But if you yeah. wait too long, it, it you know, like I said, it, it doesn't it, become yeah. relevant, and you've got to keep it fresh. And the other thing is, you know, and so I'll give you guys a plug, and I, and I love you guys, because... You guys, unlike the mainstream media, if you look at NBC, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, all of them. Right? Yeah, we can make fun of them when they're, you, co- when you they're here later. You guys do not have to correct yourself as often as they do. And they look how long it takes them. I mean, that's the interesting thing is that in this modern realm, a lot of people say, well, you know, bloggers post instantaneously. They don't check their facts, you know, and, and they get things wrong. You guys are hitting the mark without having to update your stories an awful lot. And when you do update them, it's not really a correction point. It's an addition to the story where Fox is taking stories down. CNN is going, oh, we got that one all wrong. And and it's amazing. I mean, there's a a method to your madness. We don't post without research. And, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's pure opinion. But, I mean, if it's it's facts, we make sure we got the facts. Here's what I'm going to say, though. How many tech guys do we have at Granite Grok? There's something, Most to be of us. Said, there's something to be said coming from the tech industry where, you, you know, you, analytically, you're, you're, we, got it, we have to be pretty smooth about how we collect our information and be ready to introduce it immediately. Well, one of the things that I think that plays into this, Jeff, is early I, – I started blogging back in 2006, and blogging had really kind of started yeah. 2001 for the very, very early adopters. It was starting to get on the roll, you know, 2004, 2005, and six. And what I observed is that everybody linked back to their original sources. Right. And I have made that a mantra. It's not really an official rule. I only have two for the right. writers at Granite Rock. But I always told people, if you're going to write and you're going to opine on something, you had better link back because I may have to go back and take a look at it. Right. And it's a service for our readers. And it, 
you know, it just happens to also make everybody a better reader. I mean, a better writer because right. here's what it is. We want to be open. We want to be transparent. And yes, we have. There have been times when we have had to say we got this wrong. Right. But it's, it's not, very it's often, not through no. malice. No, though. That's no. The difference though. That's and a lot of times, it's you know, uh, you know, we do. Sometimes we do the instapundent thing. We grab a blurb and throw up a link, and this is what it is. Yeah. And then everybody piles on to you for what somebody else said. And I'm like, I just shared it. I, yeah, you know, it yeah. That was a gr- yeah. That was the what was your post that. Everybody jumped all over you. I for. forgot. Yeah, no. Somebody. Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, we uh, one of the most commented posts we ever had, and all he did was quote somebody else. Exactly. That's oh, great. I, that yeah, was, and that's exactly yeah. the point to start a conversation. Holy cow! <laughs> right, and and, you're, and they think you're taking a position. I do that on a, a lot on Facebook, and suddenly I, I you know, I'm, I'm I'm gone for three three hours from yeah. the post. I come back, come back. I'm like, oh my god, what in the heck? You know, you feel somebody like the, herded some diarrhea loaded cattle over my put my my Facebook yeah. page. Well, just, <laughs> you, you, know, you feel like a baby seal I, looking I at a Canadian. It's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I've just endorsed this candidate. I yeah. hate these things. Yeah. I'm going to be, you know. But the one but. thing for us that we can say is that we can say stuff that probably not, no one else in New Hampshire can, only because or will. We, we, or will, That's absolutely. Because we started off doing it anyways. We took yeah. a lot of flack. And when they attacked us, we went, smile. We are going to have some fun. Mike, you want to go find Anne Marie for us? Yeah. Sure. So I'm going to let you guys. So go. That was it's funny, funny though, I, you know, because I do the I do the I'm in the mainstream, which is funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I do, I do the mainstream article, and, and I, about a year ago, I actually linked over to one of your stories in this mainstream article, and the the emails I got from the fine friends of, of Portsmouth basically. <laughs> These Granite Grok guys are insane. I got emails about. I was like, "How could you quote back to this as a source as legitimate news?" And I and I I ended up creating a paragraph to respond back to everybody, basically going, "How can oh, you believe that even though they're not in the mainstream, that they're not the one probably the most valid news source in New Hampshire for politics?" I said, "You, what you, what you're actually contesting is that you don't agree with them." But that doesn't mean they're not valid in this conversation, and 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 it was. But I, that was one of the, the the heaviest emailed stories I did because I went back to to one of the sources you did. I forget what it might have been voter fraud, um, but it was hilarious too. That you know, oh no, they're not a legitimate source, and I'm like, and then at the same time, I'm getting emails for all right. Uh, Jeff, know, miscellaneous, Steve. miscellaneous blue is a legitimate source, you know, and stuff like <laughs> have that. You, uh, have if you found out yeah. how many refugees Martha Fuller Clark's going to let live in her voter motor hotel, there, uh, <laughs> well, she's I, got I a lot of room. We know she's, she's got a lot of room. She's expanding out. I, I think that you have to take your reservations earlier. I think there are act- she's actually on uh, TripAdvisor uh, for <laughs> oh, nice, <laughs> the room nice. early. So I'll, I'll take pictures for you. Just let me know if you want me to wander down that way. You know, I'll just go yeah, there. That's your yeah. neighborhood, yeah. by all means. Go check right, it out. It's time to uh, spruce up the show with intellect. And, and uh, intelligence. And oh, of course, so yes, we're going to have only one way to do that is to bring Amory Banfield in. All right, we're going to so. we're going <laughs> to attempt to run another commercial break, and then we'll be right back. Jeff, thanks so much. All right, um, I'm still collecting audio, and let's see if this works. Last time it didn't work. We had an issue. We're going to try it. I'm just going to leave the mic up and see what happens. So, this is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at Eight North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So, if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. You have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of CNHT, GreenwichRock.com, this station, or anyone else for that matter. I like sitting at the fun table. (laughs) Notice, ladies and gentlemen, she did not say the adult table. No, I did not. It's the fun table. I I choose my words wisely. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks for stopping by here at the the Practical Federalism Forum Fun Table. Well, thanks for having me. (laughs) Thanks for covering this. Well, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we write about. Yeah. The the proper role of government is yes. my favorite phrase, and it always depends on what level that we're talking about. Yeah. Now, you are the educational liaison for Cornerstone. Yes, I am. So what do you see in all of this as a preview of what's going to happen later on today? 
Well, there's a lot of different topics that they're going to cover, but they are going to cover, you know, the federal intrusion into our classrooms, which I think is, is important, obviously. Uh, there's other topics that are going to cover, like, like property rights and things like that, that I think are equally important. But, uh, you know, I think everybody has realized that over time we've lost control of our classroom, and parents really, the taxpayers, are supposed to be controlling that situation, and they're not. And I think we're going to cover that today, and, and people are going to understand that, um, you know, that the federal government is now pretty much, I mean, they're, they're telling us how to do our report cards. It's gotten that bad. And there's also the assault from the other side, which you're well aware of, where the teachers are taking an attitude towards the taxpayers and the parents. We've, I've written about this. I've, vid- I've got video of this up yeah. in Moultonboro of teachers basically berating the parents. Your mm-hmm. kids know more than you do. Your kids are more advanced than you are. That they are responsible for the kids and not the parents. And I will tell you, there's somebody very close to me going to one of the New Hampshire community colleges mm-hmm. studying to get an associate's in special ed. And you know what her professor told us? What? Or told her? Don't trust the parents. Oh, and that, that's prevalent. It is. That's prevalent. And you know the thing about it So much it is, so that we talk about it every week because it keeps yeah. coming up because it's so important that, that they're being taught this. Mm-hmm. It's just... Don't you know, this goes parents. back to Bill Ayers, you know, Obama's yes. best, best yep. buddy. Yep. And they don't see schools the way that we did. I mean, we are right. of gray-haired age now yep. where we, we went to school <laughs> to, be, to get a grounding in academic subjects. Yep. Now yep. It, it is literally about indoctrination. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you see it, and it's getting worse, and it's, it's, it's not getting better with Common Core. And so, you know, I think that what, the nice thing about Common Core, it put a name on it. Now we know what to battle. You know, mm-hmm. now we know what to fight. Well, you know they'll change the name because that's what liberals yeah. do. That's true. Well, yeah. they have already started that. Sorry, progressives <laughs> who changed their name. <laughs> They've already started that, yes. Yeah. Education, climate chaos. <laughs> well, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, Glenn Reynolds, who runs the very influential Instapundent, you know, one of the biggest uh, libertarian conservative blog sites in the world, yeah. actually, has been blogging about the K K to 12 implosion. And now it's drifting into the college as, as we watch college reform and the college fix and some of these other websites. And we see the absolute nuttiness going on. <laughs> I mean, I almost want to. Oh, you Sorry. did something. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was. Try, keep talking. So, keep talking. Uh, keep I talking. almost want to take my recording camera and go downstairs and do one of those man in the streets. Uh, you know, we, we are sitting <gasps> yes. here at SN, SNHU above the dining hall. Yes. They will come here yes. and just ask them a few questions about federal. <laughs> who sits on are the you Supreme having Court? a lot of fun, I am. Steve? Don't worry. It's fine. Ask We're still broadcasting. Like, like, who sits on the Supreme Court? Can they name any of the justices? Those kind of things. Like, like basic who civic knowledge. Who's Court? your yeah. senator? Who's, who's your U.S. Governor? senator? <laughs> yeah, who's the governor? That would be awesome. No, I, I'm just asking, <laughs> do you even know what federalism is? Yeah. Oh, that's the, they exactly. will have no clue. Yeah. Who's so. supposed to be in charge? The federal government? Yeah. Or, and I have my constitutions here with me. And I can go, show me. Yeah. yeah. And, I, mean, and I, 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 I mean, that's <laughs> the thing. Liberals think federalism means the federal government yes. runs everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. And yeah. we see this in the ongoing budget battles. Yeah. Uh, what are I'm, you? <laughs> I'm just having some fun. You keep going. I'm trying to fix. This yeah, problem. but I'm waiting for you to break my board. I'm not going to break the <laughs> no, board. No, no. So, so uh, apologies, folks. We have Frank and we have Frank and Stein trying to breathe new life into our monster board. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so my middle name is Francis. I, I, I don't heard care. Music. That was like oh, some music. <laughs> yeah, we can do music. Yeah. Are you speaking today? Yes, at 2.45, I will be on a panel um, talking about Common Core and, and kind of going over it for those people who just, you know, a, a little more detail about what it all means. I think a lot of people have a basic understanding now of Common Core, so we're going to kind of talk about the federal role and, and things like that and kind of give a, maybe a, a little more information on why it's really not good. Okay. You know, I keep waiting. I, I get all these emails from you, and you're always doing lots of stuff. I keep thinking. When is she going to post this on Granite Rock? I know. Okay, and now that you've told me that, now that you've busy, reminded busy, me, busy, I will busy, do busy, busy, Because busy. I always forget. I think I had, didn't Stephen, didn't I ask you to post something? Because yeah, I was I like, have. I can't I, remember how to do it. So it's just easier if you just, just post it. it. So you know what? That's what I'll do. You. I'm going to send it. And, <laughs> and, and her name, she's got a name. Yeah. She does. She has an authorship on Granite Rock. Yeah, I know. I know. And I did post it. But I'm just not a technical person very well. I'm not good at technical stuff. This is just a word processor with two extra things. That's it. It messes me up. Trust me. You're better off having somebody post it for me. Cause we'll, we'll walk you through it. 
the uh, you know it's not a problem. If, yeah. I mean, I okay. may not see it right away. So if it's time sensitive, it okay. No alert, but, alert. Uh, okay. I don't have a problem. Is that's really the editor role in my title? Yeah. I don't go and edit people's stuff. I take the stuff they give me. Like I get stuff from all kinds of people. I've Rock got, watch. I've got watch something stuff for you. And, and, the, the post on the Jeb Bush visit this mm-hmm. week. The okay. post that I posted on my Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and post that on Granite Rock. His his visit here. Okay. I was able to ask a couple questions. Oh, good. And um. Because you know he's a big Common Core supporter. Uh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know this, and this is the thing that, and I just saw in the latest polls he's down to four percent now. So. Oh wow! Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, oh wait, uh, who who is it running the next debate? Is it NBC, CNBC? Oh, I don't know. MSNBC. MSNBC. They have declared that asterisk level is three <laughs> percent. There's no okay, guys. There, there's no junior debate. Uh, with a little more effort, Jeb Bush doesn't get on the stage. Oh wow! Well, you know what? I think it's Common Core. I'm not, not. I don't think it's just Common Core, but I think no. that is an anchor on his 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 run, his campaign, without a doubt. Well, it's the other thing is that, I mean, he wrapped this around his own neck. Too. Act of love. Yes, we're going to break the rule of law just because people want to come here for a better life. It's like, why are you letting them do here when we see the absolute horror show that's going on in Europe? Well, they all they want is a. A, a nicer life as well and we see that the european union saying oh this is nice it sounds good and now they're going oh crap <laughs> i mean that's really what it's coming down to because yeah. they can't handle it if you cannot assimilate the people coming in you no longer have a country milton friedman famously said you can either have open borders or you can have a welfare state you can't have both yeah. and i've i've got a couple of posts ready to go up or at least bookmarked where some of the German families in government housing are being kicked out of their apartments to let immigrants move in. Now, oh, wow. what is the purpose of a country? Yeah. Is what's going on there, what's been happening here, the lowering value of one's citizenship? Yeah. I, I look at this from a, a rule of law. The purpose is of government is to protect its citizens. And you go, I can't believe... Th- they're going to do this. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, you know, on, on that, the, you know, the immigration, I mean, you know, do we have a citizenship test? You know, those kind of things that, that you know, when, when people come over here, there is a way to get over here. And maybe that needs to be reformed, but it's not through illegal activity. But, well, the problem is Obama about a month ago said, you don't, when people were taking their pledge after they'd done all that stuff, he told them flat out, "You don't have to assimilate. Prize your own culture." Oh boy, yeah. I mean, well, what are you part of La Raza? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And I think it's a, just like the citizenship test. Hold of a mirror. All right, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you look at that and you go, you look at our the level of citizenship that we have. What's left? The yeah. vote. Yeah. And even that, a lot of these progressives are starting to say, oh, they've been here mm, for years. Not for very much longer. Yeah. We should give them the vote. It's happening in California. It's happening in New York City and a bunch of other places as well. And I, and I have to blame it, to swing back to what your specialty is, our education system. Yep. Because if you don't know what our foundational history That's is, if right. you don't know what our foundational philosophy is, if yep. you don't know what our fil- foundational politics is, then anything's possible. Yes. And, well, and, and, yeah. And by and, the way, the, da- the Danes read Milton Friedman. The Danes have d- have declared that benefits for newly arrived uh, refugees will be cut in half, and they're taking out adverts in the Middle East saying, "Don't come here. We're being cheap." Well, <laughs> the other thing about Jeb Bush too is he did away with a, a, a requirement for civics education in Florida. And now the thing about Florida, that, you know, that New Hampshire people probably aren't aware of. You, they have a lot of immigrants, and so they have a lot of people who have never learned U.S. history and U.S. civics. And he does away with those requirements in school. They may never go, even the, the students may never get that, even if they go through the American public schools in Florida. Yeah. I mean, this is turning out to be what the Brits did years ago. Uh, Mike, was it the Tories or Labor? When? That said, uh, we're going to open up um, immigration. And you had a whole flock of people coming in who really didn't in under, <laughs> who really didn't understand the history. We're doing it again here. Yeah. So yeah, I, they, I, I, they I, said, they, decade, what, a decade later, they said, we did this on purpose because we couldn't get anywhere with the current 
population back then, so we imported a new po- new population of voters. That was yeah. almost certainly the Labour Party because the, the country was naturally conservative. Yeah. Um, but but also, uh, you know, the, the Brits thought they actually had some kind of obligation because as they unwound the empire and turned into a commonwealth, uh, all of those folks that had been British passport holders, actually, were, were given the right of residence, and we expected a few. We got a flood. Uh, we, you know, we had the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Hong Kong Chinese, the, uh, um, you know, the Jamaicans Mon. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, uh, it was a hell of a melting pot, and most of them wanted to assimilate. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. A couple of decades later, some of them have decided to unassimilate oh. the Islamic ones. I um. broke my display. Oh, okay. So rather than spend a bunch of money to send it out and get it repaired, I just bought a portable external. I didn't know you could do which that. I just wow. made shut down. Wow. Very nice. So I had to plug it in again. Very nice. But, um, yeah, yeah uh, these are actually pretty handy. Um, they have their own little, if you want to have extra monitors for 80 to 100 bucks, you can just stand them up in there. Plug them in USB power. You don't have a separate cord. It's pretty cool. Anyway, we're going to take it. We're going to attempt to take a break again because I think I fixed the audio. This, this is your positive. jury-rigged this granite your crock. Jury-rigged granite crock. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Drug at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is the repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. on you. Absolutely. <laughs> he is to Iowa what we are to New Hampshire. Ah, caffeinated thoughts. The man. The legend. <laughs> <laughs> the one they love to hate. Congratulations. You're like us. Yes. They don't <laughs> like you either, so you're doing something right. <laughs> yeah. So, how are you, Shane? Hey, pretty good. How are you guys? We are doing well. Shane is from Iowa. I am. And uh, we have talked to you uh, in the past Come every single four years, it seems, lately, mm-hmm. last couple of cycles. And Finger on the pulse in Iowa. I try yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going on out there? Who's the, the, up, who's down, and who's going loop-de-loop? The pulse is erratic right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Um, it's just, this is wild. I mean, I, I was just on, on my radio program on, uh, last week. We were talking, actually. It's Which is week. on? It's on uh, uh, the Truth Network 99.3 FM in Des Moines. And then we uh, podcast it. Actually, podcast is up at caffeinatedthoughts.com for this week, actually. We were talking about uh, the race, and we were looking at the Real Clear Politics average polls in Iowa <laughs> and in New Hampshire, and the top three are identical. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, when has that ever happened? That mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the thing that's, I think, very different about this is that normally here in New Hampshire we have two or three conservatives and the moderates popping through. Right. In this case, it's absolutely versed, and I love it. Yeah. It's, this is it, great. It, it's it's strange to, it's to watch. Not only are the – I mean, it's, it's just this anti-politician, not even just anti-establishment, but anti-politician thing going on. Oh, yeah. Uh, that we're seeing in Iowa is, that's happening here in New Hampshire. And, um, you know, in some respects it's really cool. Uh, in some other respects it's kind of, you know, I think some quality candidates are getting buried under mm. the trend that's <clears throat> happening here. I would agree. I would agree. I mean, like Ted Cruz, for example. Right. Who's highly regarded as a, a solid conservative candidate who's coming in anywhere between 6 and 9%, uh-huh. um, which is, you know, fourth or fifth, depending right. on the order and how everything shakes out. But, you know, that puts him near people like John Kasich. Yeah. You know, and it, you're like, Kasich and Cruz are not the same. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> yeah. and, and one thing I, you know, I've been, uh, one thing you're probably not seeing here in, in New Hampshire, but Jindal, uh, nationally, his polling's, it's non-existent. In Iowa, it's better. It's about 3%. Okay. But 
here's this governor that actually has a pretty good record, and he's just totally being ignored. Mm-hmm. Um, however, you know, we're seeing him have some movement in Iowa too. He's got he's getting some good crowds at events that he goes to, and but he's still not showing up he's, in the polling. He's a very very smart guy. And, yeah, I've been a little surprised because he could be seen as being an outside person, even though he is governor of Louisiana. Right. But uh, yeah, he's been very, very, very uh, hard on, on establishment Republicans. I mean, he's, you know, said, for instance, if we can't stand on our principles, why have a Republican Party? And, and you know, <laughs> we've been we, saying we've been that for years. <laughs> right. For a decade now. <laughs> right, right. It is what it is. Yeah. We finally got a governor to say it. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and, you know, this comes back to what I see is a lot of people have been saying, well, where's the Tea Party? The Tea Party's dead. No, we went underground. We stopped with the big rallies. Right. We, we were very, you know, back in 2010, it was still very visible as Tea Party. But now you're starting to see that bubble up right. to where you've got Tea Party folks in Congress. You've got Tea Party folks in the Senate. And yeah. now you've got them as presidential candidates, and they're actually getting traction on their issues. Yes, definitely. So, oh, take a picture. Have, yeah, get a, guy, get a picture. Oh, get, a, get a picture of the take a granite rock guys. Ah, well, by the way, you can always take this. We post it up, and you can take it off of YouTube or Ustream or what have you. And Great. go ahead and, and do that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this will be fun. And we're, we'll try to have you on our show Saturday mornings. Okay, sounds 9 good. 9 to 11 yeah, I mean, Eastern. we can definitely call. You can call us from anywhere. <laughs> Great. So we can have you on the show. Great. I remember standing outside my bank one time talking to you guys. Yeah. So, <laughs> which was, also, yeah, a lot of fun. You guys do good work. And, and I'm very, it's int- going to be interesting to see what happens today, uh, what kind of response we get. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, it, it's nice. It's neat being in Iowa and coming here to New Hampshire and hearing these candidates and see, are they telling you guys the, the same, same thing, thing that they're yeah. saying in Iowa? Um, and, I, I, and some of them do. Sorry, and, hey, and I, I suspect yeah. both Cruz and Santorum will, yeah. and this Fiat Arena as well. You know, sometimes yeah. she says some things and then forgets well, that well, she said it. Speaking of Jeb, he is one that has said different things to different people. Yeah. Certainly he'll not really see him all that much in Iowa, though. <laughs> no, but you, but you, but you know. To, I to wonder be, why. Yeah, yeah to, be, to be fair. Jeb who? Jeb who? Yeah. Jeb who? Yeah, to be, to be, to be <laughs> fair, not, not that it would have pleased you guys, uh, he did say he was against uh, ethanol subsidies when he was in Iowa. Yeah, a lot time. of Iowans are against ethanol subsidies, too. Yeah, well, yeah, burning con- out their cars now? Yeah, conser- <laughs> cons- conservatives <laughs> generally are against ethanol subsidies, yeah. even the ones in Iowa. Uh, but uh, he, he went there and he said it, uh, which, uh, which I thought was, was decently courageous of him because mm-hmm. Scott Walker went there and didn't say it. Right. Yeah, we've had a number of candidates last cycle say that they were against ethanol subsidies. What they want is just a level playing field and, and let the free market decide. Um, you know, uh, you got the renewable fuel standard that some people like into a subsidy, but it's really not. Um, but, yeah, most of the ethanol subsidies actually mm-hmm. in federal at the federal level have gone away. Yeah. Uh, in Iowa, we still have a state one, but, you know, if they got rid of that. I mean, if they got rid of that, I'll, I'll fill up with something else. <laughs> well, <laughs> cer- certainly the cost of this. I'd be happy if they took the ethanol out of my gas. I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah our engines would last a whole lot longer. Pretty good. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you again. Yeah, a lot yeah. of a lot of people at a live event, and uh, all kinds of folks coming by, and we aren't yep. going to have any kind of time to talk to them all because once the event starts, that'll be it. Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. going to have to run the event with occasional comments in the crevices. That's yep. right. <laughs> yeah, at, at lunchtime. So, maybe, so, for our listeners. Biggest difference between Iowa voters and what you see here in New Hampshire? Oh well, I mean, Iowa, we get we get pegged as being having a lot of evangelicals, and that's true. Um, there's pro- so there's probably a greater subsection of evangelicals in Iowa than you'd have in New Hampshire. Uh, we have the most unchurched state in the union. Yeah, he, he, here's all our evangelicals right here. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's how small it is. <laughs> you know, especially since this event is sponsored by Cornerstone, there's a, there's a grain of truth to that. I wouldn't say it was all the evangelicals, but I I guarantee you a good percentage of them are here. Yeah, yeah, yeah more more at this event than. More most others. Okay. Yeah, so definitely we probably have, uh, I mean, social conservative issues are, are brought up more, prob- I would assume, in Iowa than you'd mm-hmm. see out here, even though um, voters in Iowa are, are concerned about the economy and they're concerned about the national debt and they're concerned about foreign policy. So a lot of actually what I'm seeing in town halls is, generally speaking, um, they're not leading with social conservative issues. They're leading with, with some of these other things. 
other than religious liberty has been a huge thing yep. with with Kim Davis and and uh, as, and some of the other things we've seen going on. So um, Ted Cruz actually had a huge religious liberty rally. Um, and gosh, I want to say in April. Well, um, he and was, Mar- and Marco Rubio have been pretty strong on that, and Bobby Jindal has been very strong on that right, as well. Right. So. Um, but that, that's probably the biggest difference, I think, between an Iowa voter and New Hampshire voter, which is probably why, you know, um, our, our uh, who we send out of the Iowa caucus looks a little bit different than who goes out out of the New Hampshire primary. Well, sometimes it's also uh, New Hampshire tends to be a little contrarian as well. Although right. with this year, um, I have been to a couple of the the Donald. Uh, Donald Trump rallies. And I will tell you, the people who were showing up, there are some faces I recognize okay. from the right. And I see people I know to be Democrats, but I see a whole lot of people I do not know. Yeah. And um, it's a different crowd than the normal politician rally crowd. Right. And I think where Trump could do, well, for instance, I don't think he's going to turn people out on caucus night like he could possibly turn people out to a primary. You guys have an open primary, right? You can, Unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So, that, which I think would benefit him. But it, it's so it's a little bit different than voting for, in an open primary that goes pretty much all day, for the most part, right? Right. Uh, compared oh, to you, you got to go at seven Sorry. o'clock out there, out to a particular. Good morning, another VIP. Other yeah. out to a particular location. It could be snowing, whatnot. Um, so mainly, mainly the different. I mean, the difference between your typical Iowa caucus voter and your typical New Hampshire primary voter is the the Iowa caucus voter is the, the, those are our grassroots activists because mm-hmm. nobody else takes the time to come out on a on a you know nobody, a Tuesday no, night in no, February no, when it's exactly. cold. Nobody else is that stupid or that committed. Take your pick. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and and here in New Hampshire, you know. The weather can get a little severe as well. Mm-hmm. And I'll remember one January 1st day, the last cycle, going to a VFW hall and seeing how many people, because it was in my hometown, next door to my hometown, so that's the reason why I went, how packed it was in a blizzard Yeah. for John McCain at a VFW hall. Now I just throw him out, and at, the, at that time he was quite popular, but it was amazing to see how many people actually took the time to drive these back mountainous roads where, you know, my house, I've got a couple hundred foot drops on some of the roads I'm on. Wow. And uh, those barriers ain't going to hold you back. No. And over you go. But people went out to see it. And it was just, I, I was really shocked, to be honest with you, even though I've lived here in New Hampshire for 30 years. Yeah. Just and, very you know, and, and, and talking about the electoral cycle and, and Trump and the voter base, you know, there are people, not only are you seeing people you've never seen vote before, but diehard conservatives that would have died rather than vote for a Mitt Romney or a John McCain are coming out for Trump. Yeah. One, one of our occasional correspondents, Mr. McGrath, uh, is, uh, is a Trumpite. Well, here's another question for you Do you see the same anger in the electorate out there? That we are seeing here. Yes. With, I mean, I look at the blogosphere all the time, but he, even talking to some people here, they have had it with the establishment Republicans. Yeah, that's we're seeing that too. Uh, it's they pe- especially people are sick of what they're seeing in, in the Senate, and then then you know you come back and they'll say, well, if, if only you would elect, you know, a majority Republican. You know, for instance, in our case, Iowa Senate, because our our Senate right now is Democrat led, and people are rolling their eyes like, well, gee, we just did that for. You know, the U.S. Senate, we just we now have two Republican senators representing Iowa, and they both just voted for this continuing resolution um, that, you know, didn't end up defunding Planned Parenthood. They have they they've not stood up and fought uh, against the executive amnesty. They've not stood up and fought against the Iran deal. Um, instead, they're everybody's hiding behind. Oh, well, Senate decorum. Well, we don't want to use a nuclear option. Get rid well, of the filibuster. Well, well the, the Democrats would, damn it. The Democrats would somehow cook something up with the House that required a, a reconciliation and a 50-person vote, and, and, and they would get it. So you, you are saying, then, that your new senator is not going whole hog conservative. Yeah, she's. Well, I don't see her fighting. I mean, I think, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to disagree. I, you know, I think, she'll, I think she's a conservative, but I just don't see them fighting. And and maybe there's something there's in the wa- something in the water when you get to the U.S. Senate. I don't oh, know. Oh, there is, and you know what I think? I think it, it's it, the chamber's leadership has, in one manner or another, castrated these people. They always do. Right. The freshmen come in, 
and and they and they grab them and they're like, if you ever want to have any voice, any influence, anything at all, you're going to do what we tell you. And a lot of them just go, okay. You know, it's time. <laughs> you know. It's time that Heritage and Club for Growth were waiting there on inauguration days and saying. Uh, excuse us, but we can castrate your hopes a different way if you yeah. don't vote right. Yeah. And we did that here in New Hampshire. I don't know whether you know this, but the top two on the ticket back in November, Scott Brown for U.S. Senate and Walt Havenstein for governor, we made them lose. Mm. We, t- One of them just totally disrespected the base, yeah. called us teabaggers, and refused to apologize. We warned him. This is what's going to happen if you continue to do this. Then he flip-flopped on Medicaid expansion about getting rid of it. Scott Brown, on the other hand, came in from Massachusetts with a bad record on the Second Amendment, which is a very strong, very vocal group here, and then decided to try to out-abortion Gene Shaheen. Yeah. Uh, yeah he, he, was, he was bad both ways. I mean, he held, he held a, uh, a Second Amendment town hall and then shut most of the uh, conservatives out. One second. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh. And that really, um, they were shocked. Yeah. And I crowed about it because we're, we certainly were not the only ones working for that. But I'll take credit for it for Granite Rock because as I've told people, and maybe you can take this back to Iowa, Republicans, you have to win 51% of the vote. Right. I only have to change between a half and a point and a half in every district because if you look in our districts, right. they're very, very small. I literally, in, in a lot of districts, only have to change between three and 25 people. That's it. Yeah. And you lose. And if you're not going to be a fire-breathing, flag-waving, gun-toting. Charging, gun-toting. Yeah, yeah, there, outspoken yeah this. That thing, this yeah. stuff. Yeah. If you're not going to be willing to stand up for conservative values, what good are you? Yeah, true. And they learned. Now, and this whole idea of the 603 Alliance doing a caucus, so to get that one conservative folks that, yeah, maybe not my first or second one, but we'll go there and push them through the moderates, they are hating on us. This okay. is so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, uh, candidates that, dis, that you know, uh, disrespect the base lose, period. They, might, they may end up winning the primary or, or they get the nomination, but... When it comes to the general election, people just were just not going to turn out and vote. Yeah, just look at Presidents Ford and Dole and Romney and McCain. Right. You know, and they just don't seem to want to understand this message. Yeah. They still think of us, uh, tell me what this is in Iowa, but I think the establishment Republicans hate us more, um, hate their own base more in New Hampshire than they do the Democrats. Oh, I, I think that's that's something that's universal in any state. Uh, we sense that in Iowa, too. Uh, right now we have an establishment governor who I think it, he, well, for instance, I've never been able to get him on my radio program for an interview. Yeah. But, oh, hey, no problem. I'll go talk to the Des Moines Register. Mm-hmm. Um, not a <laughs> these, conservative outlet the, These are not your friends. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I think I'll be friendlier to you than they will be, but, you know, anyway, yeah, it's, whatever. It's, it's like the folks here would talk to the Nashua Telegraph, uh, which is liberal, might talk to the union leader, which is Rhino, mm-hmm. uh, but wouldn't talk to us. Or, or Fosters. Or, yeah, some of them would. Concord will. Monitor, Keene Sentinel, yeah. Portsmouth Herald, they're Con- all way to the left Concord, of us. Concord Monitor, we call Pravda on the Merrimack. <laughs> or, 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 or the Concord Fish Wrap. It's your classic, <laughs> yes. Capital City left wing rag. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we're not know, polite. I only got about uh, <laughs> yeah. got about forty or fifty seconds because this vent's going to start real soon. We yeah, got to yeah, change yeah. some wires. So. Uh, uh, okay, right. so, so you know, thinking of the war on the base uh, and and the uh, the Senate going wimpy. Did you see uh, when uh, Lindsey Graham and, and Jindal were on the stage and Jindal got all wound up in Lindsey's face? Mm-hmm. That, that was, it's time to be done with that the Republican was fun. Party. That was his best moment in that debate, I think. It um, was. I, I, I managed to condense it down to about a minute of his best yeah. uh, and posted it. It was fabulous. It was fabulous. So, yep, um, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. And, I, like, I have no clue what's going to happen. I think Trump's going to go down. I don't see him turning people out in the Iowa caucus. Uh, but He has shaken stuff up Carson, and brought in issues. Carson, however, has some great. Here comes great, Jeff. He's got a good ground game. Nope, nope. Okay. The arena is pulling well, but she doesn't have the ground game I've seen others have in Iowa. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. She, with she's her. got ground game here. I right? look for her to expand in Iowa. She's uh, she's she's cautious, but she's she's gaining. Okay. 
Looking forward to it. All righty. Steve. I'm looking forward to this event. All right. We're going to. Uh, you we're need gonna to make friends with Anna Epstein if you haven't already when, oh, yeah. when the Kali people are through. Shane, thank you very much for stopping by and spending Thanks, more than a few minutes with Granite Rock. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, let's. Uh, thank you, Shane. We got to swap this out. Hey, Skip. Where's the other one? Uh, oh, good question. This is the headset one. There it is. Okay. All right, we're going to try to take a break. We'll come right back. The event's going to start in a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. Why are you going to want to listen to Grok Talk? Because when it comes to politics, news, and the culture, we are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone stomping, conservative bloggers, and activists. Grok Talk comes to you live Saturday mornings from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you missed us on Saturday, catch us on Monday from 1 to 3 p.m. Right here on The Rock, NHCR.com. Talk. Three, two, one. We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Good Good afternoon, sir. And if you are... Ken Ivory, Utah State Representative. Oh, Hi, Ken. cool. How are you? Good. And, and what brings you to New Hampshire for our federal, federalism? Well, forum? we are looking for you all to uh, <laughs> find a candidate for president that is going to... Uh, oh, get rid of those sec- federally owned s- lands? The fed- secure ah. the transfer of the federal land so we can free the land so that we don't uh, end up burning up 10 million acres of forest every year and... Burning right. millions of animals, destroying our watershed, and making our communities unsafe, and and, and, and uh, bulldozing Bundys and all the rest of it. We yeah. actually had a, a guy that we work with here in New Hampshire, um, who was on the Bundy Ranch and uh, was in charge of coordinating the defense of the ranch, and we had him live on the show for two hours while he was there. What a story that was! Yeah, you know that's really unfortunate. If you look at uh, that never should have been in that situation. Nevada and Nebraska have the exact same enabling act, the mm-hmm. exact same terms of statehood. In fact, the western states and the eastern states all have the same terms of statehood, mm-hmm. that the federal government held the lands in trust to mm-hmm. dispose of them at statehood. That's what the Constitution says. Imagine that the, yeah. the Constitution says Congress has the power to dispose, and we should expect that they would do that. I mean, it never should have gotten there. So Nevada and Nebraska, their statehood was within three weeks of each other, their mm-hmm. statehood agreement. Nevada goes from more than 30% federal land down to 1%. Nebraska yep. does, while Nevada goes from 86% to 81%, and it's still locked up. They have 80-plus percent land that's federally controlled uh, and, in Nevada. And, and, and they keep declaring parks and monuments and other things to make those lands unavailable for any kind of commercial or other use by the states. Yeah, correct. And so when you think about it, I mean, we all want healthy air, healthy water, healthy wildlife. We want we want safe and vibrant communities and abundant recreational opportunities. And we've been told that the way to get that is to have bureaucrats thousands of miles away lock the lands up like they're in a museum. But it's not working. What that's getting us is millions of acres burned, air polluted, watershed destroyed, millions of animals killed, and communities depressed. And so yeah. we've got to free the lands. And so who better to manage a garden than the gardener who knows the conditions, knows the soil, knows the climate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing is Canada's already done this. So Canada was in the same situation where their land was federally controlled, and they realized this doesn't work. And so they've turned land, water, resources over to the provinces and territories. So, guys, clearly, we should be able to protect liberty, property, self-governance at least as well as Socialist Canada does, don't you think? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, you would New, hope Hampshire's, so. uh, New Hampshire's got a lot of... Uh, you can't really tell on this map, but um, if you look at, at the um, all the land that's not just been locked up by the federal government, but we have these environmental agencies that come in and they tie land up. You know, for watershed or whatever they want to do, and it, there's a map of it somewhere. And I think Jane asked us to take a look at it, and she had a link to it. And the whole state's just sucked yeah. up. You know, it's not, it's not. Nobody owns it, but these organizations and and the federal government. And it's been d- done on purpose, where they want to say, well, it's for next generations. No, this is more insidious <laughs> than that. They just don't want people outside of certain areas, and this is where they want to. They want the pristine. Areas that never really existed. 
Yeah. And when you think about this kind of museum management, federal bureaucrats are locking the land up like it's a museum. Hands off, don't touch, right? Yeah. Well, what that's getting us is tree densities that are catastrophic. That's why we're seeing millions right. of acres burned. And, and that's going to leave scarred landscapes, devastated watersheds for generations. Yeah. That's not saving the land for the next generation. No, not at all. And it's not saving the air or the planet either. It's releasing far more carbon and, and other gases into the uh, into the atmosphere. And uh, ozone, uh, yeah. don't forget. Yeah, Trees tell, create yeah, ozone. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, <laughs> exactly let, let, right. let's, let's have Gene McCarthy come and suck on that. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, when you think about so, so why would they invite a Utah representative talking about Western lands to New Hampshire, right? Because it affects it, all of us. It affects all of us. Yeah. So, so think about this. You all are paying. They're extracting two billion dollars a year to manage and subsidize and cripple Western states. Well, that's coming from the Eastern states. Now, more importantly, when Congress wants to grow, they have the getaway car. When Congress wants to grow its spending, when they want to grow its power at everyone's expense. They hold $400 million a year hostage in the subsidy payments called PILT, payment in lieu of taxes. I've got counties that have less than 3% taxable land. And so you all are subsidizing for Mm -hmm. the federal government to control that land. Well, when they want to grow food stamps, for example, Harry Reid wanted to grow food stamps $750 billion. Mm -hmm. He holds $400 million hostage, and the western states have to vote for it because that's their lifeline. And so they grow the government at everyone's expense because they hold those western lands hostage, and that's that's eroding our very uh, the very fabric of our constitutional system. Yeah. Well, the question I have is, given that the the western states have been complaining about this for decades, why aren't they electing folks that will go to D.C. and say enough of this nonsense? Yeah, you know, it's a really fascinating question. That's happened throughout history. Do you know that that same question came up when? Michigan and Iowa and Louisiana and that great western state of Florida was 90% federally controlled for decades. Mm -hmm. And there was one senator from Missouri, a Democrat. His name was Thomas Hart Benton. And he said, my election to the Senate found me doing battle for changing this system of disposing the public lands. He said, I resolved to move against the whole system because it's a monopoly and it's, it's, it's monopolizing the vacant lands of the West. He's talking about Florida. He's talking mm. about Iowa and Michigan. <laughs> and he said they need to fix their eyes steadily on the period of the speedy extinction of the federal title to all the lands. And they did. And so that's the key. So that's being here. You guys are the lead state in picking the, picking the presidential contender. That senator's name was Thomas Hart Benton. So we need you all in New Hampshire to find the modern-day Thomas Hart Benton to free up the lands. Let me tell you another reason why it matters to people in New Hampshire and across the nation. 60 Minutes about three months ago did a piece that said our modern life devices are in the grips of China. All your computer technology here, renewable energy technology, and our military technology. Mm-hmm. The, the rare earth metals which are used in magnets and electronics, right? Exactly right. The rare earth elements. China controls nearly 90% of the market on rare earth elements. We can't put a plane in the air, a battleship on the water, without China agreeing to source rare earth elements. Guess what we have locked up from New Mexico to Alaska? Rare of course. The elements. world's most abundant supply of rare earth elements. What sane nation puts its national security in the grips of foreign powers? NIMBYs. That's what it comes down to. Wow. Nothing anywhere near me. Not in my backyard, but then you've also got the bananas, which is basically build absolutely nothing anywhere near me. <laughs> I love that one. I always like that. Yeah, no, exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Now, here's, a, here's another one for you. Um, in just Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming, there's more recoverable oil than the rest of the world combined, mm-hmm. locked up in federally controlled lands. Oh, I, yep. I, I believe it. And Obama keeps moving to, uh, to lock up a bit more of it. And Clinton did the same when he was in charge. And even Bush was persuaded to do some of that by, you know, by the mostly liberal Congress, even when it had Republicans in it. Exactly yeah. right. So Clinton, three weeks before his last election, locked up 2 million acres in Garfield County, in and around Garfield County, southern Utah. $2 trillion worth of the world's cleanest burning coal they lock up a monument, never talk to a single Utahn. He announces it standing in Arizona. They talk to the Democrats all around the state. Their own, their own Center for Environmental Quality said, this doesn't warrant protection on this scale. We didn't do a NEPA analysis, National Environmental Policy Analysis. They just locked it up as a monument. Yeah. And Garfield County, where that's located, just recently declared an economic state of emergency because their schools have now gone from 157 through 12 students to 50. Their schools are about to close. They know when their schools close, they lose their families, and their their county becomes a ghost county. They only have 3% taxable land. And so we're calling on people in New Hampshire to hire 
a presidential candidate like that Thomas Hart Benton that has the courage to bring about the only solution big enough for the economic security of our nation, national security, environmental protection. We don't need to be burning 10 million acres with the federal government, federal bureaucrats managing it like a museum where it's hands off, don't touch. We got to manage the land like a so, garden. So, but so, this so, also why, so why aren't these states? Sorry, why aren't these states producing governors and senators that are going to say the hell with this? You do not have the right to these lands. We're going to seize them. Not one of us and take on the federal government, but ten or twenty states are going to seize these lands. They are our lands. They are state lands. Get the hell out! And by the way, your federal agents aren't welcome. Yeah, and that's starting to happen. Yeah. Uh-huh. The, the other problem <laughs> that comes up, and we've we've been fighting it for a number of years here, is the EPA HUD and DOTs Sustainable Communities Initiative, which they've really pushed hard here. We're seeing it in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. We're seeing it in the Oakland base, um, where they're turning to unelected, unaccountable bureaucratic agencies, giving them a ton of money, and trying to do. Um, and I hate to say it because then we, you get referred to as tin hat uh, folks. But the Agenda 21, which is to rack them and stack them, we see this out in Portland where the housing prices are so high because they say, this is our urban containment philosophy. You cannot build further out. And then they wonder why nobody poor lives there anymore. Right. I mean, right. this is basically another prong in that same approach. You're talking about the big lands, but they're also doing it to the cities as well. well what to do? Well... It- the very fundamentals of our system, liberty, property, self-governance, right? It says, to secure these rights, governments exist among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, that means we're the boss, but if we want to be treated like the boss, we got to act like the boss. And so just what you're saying, we've now got, you know, we passed my bill in Utah, the Transfer Public Lands Act. We've had legislation introduced in, in every western state but California, passed in many, Four eastern states have now done resolutions supporting the transfer of public land. So you've got South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Arkansas. Uh, I know that here in New Hampshire they tried to run it last year, so hopefully they're going to bring it back next year and and keep moving forward. But, no, this is an issue that affects everyone because property, as you were alluding to, property is the master right. George Sutherland was our one and only member of the Supreme Court from Utah. He said man has three great rights, life, liberty, property. If you, if you give a man his life, but you take away his liberty, take away all that makes life worth living. You give him his liberty, but take away the property, which is the fruit and the badge of his liberty, you still leave him a slave. Yeah, the U.S. Constitution basically, well, the Declaration said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which was originally pursuit of property. In right. the New Hampshire Constitution, it actually says property, not right. happiness, be, property. Be, because we had relatively few slaves up here, yeah. and we could do that. Uh, and, and once upon a time, this, this state had the courage of its convictions. Now we're having to fight liberals like we do everywhere else. Yeah, in fact, all the state constitutions at the time, life, liberty, property, that comes right from John Locke. Right. And by pursuit of happiness, they meant property and self-governance. Correct. Right. And the problem is, is, as we talk about all the time, the further our educational system gets away from those notions then anything can happen. Right. And that is a severe problem. All right, I think we're about to start. Um, so we're going to... Thank you very well, much. Outstanding, guys. Ken, so, uh, Ken, uh, so we're going to be posting this later. Take one of your, take one of our cards and get in touch. We'll be happy to have you on by phone on a normal Saturday. Yep, we can have you on the show any Saturday morning between That'd 9 and 11 a.m. our time, so we'll do it later so you don't have to get up too early. <laughs> That'd be great. And then uh, and and tell then, us how we can reach you. How, yes, how, for, how, for, for more information, AmericanLandsCouncil.org. AmericanLandsCouncil.org. Org. There's a petition there. Sign the petition. We want better access, health, productivity, free the lands, and then also Facebook page, American Lands Council. Thanks, guys. Right, thank, thank you very you. much. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. First speaker I'm going to introduce you to is a great leader. 
His team is just absolutely fantastic. They really move the issue of policy, especially when you talk about those things that affect the family. Of course, Brian McCormick is the uh, New Hampshire native. He currently serves as the executive director of Cornerstone Action. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for your first speaker, Brian McCormick. Well, thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate you taking the time. I actually didn't realize it was the weekend of the Deerfield Fair, and that is why my parents won't be here today. Um, but I thank you all for taking the time to do this. And what, what an opportunity, really, honestly, we have in New Hampshire uh, to come and, and understand not only policy, but presidential politics. And we have some great speakers today, a few of those candidates you will hear from. And I encourage you to take this time to learn about the federalism issue. Learn about why this is important, by and large, our nation, but also in our state. And that's kind of what I'm talking about a little bit right now, um, until they take me off with a hook. But um, in New Hampshire, one way that we see this, and you're going to hear more about this throughout the day through, from Anne Marie, who is our education liaison, and also from Emmett McCrory, who is going to talk about the larger implications for Common Core. But we see it in a big way here in Common Core. We see how the state leverages federal funds in order to coerce education systems into using the curriculum. And it's, it's a problem because no longer is it in the hands of the parents or the families to make the decision for your kids. They're saying they know what's best. And you're seeing this in a broad number of areas. You're seeing it whether it comes to education on, the sta on mathematics or the liberal arts, but then it comes into value. Um, what values are being implemented in your children? And I want to I highlight that because that is a vital, vital role that each and every one of you play, not only in your kids, but the people around you. And firmly, I believe that as we, if we're going to get our nation back, as we are slipping into decline with the current administration and the choices that have been made, we have to affect value. It's pivotal. It's the only way that we're going to affect sustainable change. Now, you see in the state, in New Hampshire, up in Guilford, where a parent took issue not specifically with the Common Core curriculum, but with a piece of a book that was in that curriculum that had very suggestive imagery and very scanty subject matter. He was taken out of a parent-teacher meeting by the police because they, disagreed, they didn't believe he had a right to voice his opinion. That's a problem. It was on Fox News. It was, this was last year. Um, this is where the federal government is reaching not just into your schools in terms of educating your children on history and mathematics. They are educating your children on value as well. And I encourage you not only to take a look at what that means by and large for our nation, but for our state and how we can effectively change the game. How can we affect change on how values are being implemented on our children, on our school systems, and really, really hold to it, stick to that standard? Now, another place where that federalism is really kind of engaged as far as the state level is in the governor's seat. Um, I've been in this position for two years now, almost two years, coming up on my anniversary in, July, in January. And Sarah will, will tell you as well, I encourage you to talk to Sarah Kosky, who is our political director, who had her first bout with the legislature this year on how difficult it is to get good policy moved through without a governor. And it is absolutely a federalism issue because those governors are the conduit through which the federal government communicates with your state. And so when these top-down decisions are made, you need a leader in that position who not only you trust, but who's going to tell you the truth about what's going on. So as you move forward today, really try and soak up the information that's being presented to you. Because we have a great opportunity where politics are centerfold or in the centerpiece of New Hampshire's culture. You guys have access to people in a way that most places don't. You know, you're the, in Concord, you can walk down the street and you can see the governor walking right down Main Street. In some places, that doesn't happen. And quite frankly, she'll usually she'll take a meeting with you at times. Um, well, just don't tell her which political affinity you have, then she might not. But. We have an opportunity, and with these campaigns, and you're going to see it, I encourage you, use those note cards. Think of some great questions. Come up with some things that you really want to press these guys on and how they're going to handle this, how they're going to, what, how are they going to affect change for states' rights. And as we do that, we can start to generate a conversation. 
we can start to build a movement that's saying, hey, something is wrong here. Something is not going right. We're seeing it at a very base level with our children. And that's very scary. It's very, very scary. And that's why this is a very important issue. Um, one place that we saw this again in New Hampshire is with the Smarter Balance Test. Um, I don't, how many of you had encountered that test here? Let me see some hands. The Smarter Balance Test. Um, I got a phone call from a parent in tears saying, I just talked to the superintendent. He said that I can't take my kid out of school. If he does, he's going to fail the class. And that I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't want him to take this test. Now, that just think for a second. That means that a parent who had the, clearly has the best interests of their children at heart was told that they cannot make that decision. There's so, that fundamentally, they're saying, you don't know enough. You don't have the right values. We know what's best. And we have to stop it from a federal level. It's categorically impossible for a top-down decision maker to know what's best for each and every one of you and your kids at that ground level. And that's what this, that's what this is all about. That's why we are holding our second federalism forum with a great attendance because this matters here. This matters. I encourage you to press the candidates on that to say, what are you going to do? How are you going to protect us? How are you going to protect state rights? And that goes all the way back to the founding of our nation. Those powers, as even though the current commander-in-chief seems to believe that he's above the Constitution, those powers were put in place to protect us. They weren't put in place to be overlooked. So that is all I have. Thank you again. Welcome. Welcome. We have a great day. I'm going to introduce you to is uh, got quite the resume. Sean Filer, of course, is the chairman for the American Principles Project. He's also president of Equinox Partners. Sean is a philanthropist, a lot of T's and a lot of F's and a lot of F's, S's in that one, and a conservative activist. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a nice warm welcome. Only New Hampshire can give to Sean Filer. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, you guys are going to know better than anybody just the anti-establishment mood that uh, that America is in. Right? We, we've been lied to. I think we're all, yeah. Um, we get it. We know it. Um, and we're determined to, to end it. Um, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing uh, in this cycle, in this uh, nomination process. Now, um, the Democrats, um, and Democrats particularly interested in truth, right, they have a, a strategy to end the to end the lie, and God bless them. They're they're true believers, um, and their solution is Bernie Sanders, and um, and his message of of hope, right? Which is not our message of hope. His message of hope is that the socialist dream is just eighteen trillion dollars in spending away, and uh, we're going to soak the rich to pay for it, and we can get there. And well, you got to love him for his honesty, right? I mean, he's that that that's an alternative vision, right? And he's telling you you know, what it is and how they're going to pay for it. Um, but that's certainly not what we want. That's certainly not what I want. Republicans also want, we want the truth, right? We want somebody who's going to, to, to shoot straight with us, um, but not just tell us, you know, how big government is and how we're going to pay for it. We want the truth about how we're going to cut the size of government, right? We want a candidate that's going to be honest about their plan to shrink the size and scope, right, to return us to the American experiment that Emmett referenced, right, in limited government, right, and give us back the prosperity and liberty that goes with that. Um, and our Republican primary process, you know, clearly reflects that, right? We've, we've had it. We're, we're searching for, you know, a new, a new leader uh, that's actually going to change things. And I think this makes a world of sense, you know, for Republicans that have been paying attention or that are actually awake, right? Just think about the journey that we've been on over the last three-plus decades, right? We elected Reagan, and government got bigger. 
right? And then we had the class of 94. We had Newt, and government got bigger. And we had George W. Bush. We had, we had Congress. We had the Senate with the House. Government got bigger. Um, so, so you've got to you, – we're not just going to have another election, right? We're going to have a movement. Um, so we started the Tea Party, right? And, um, and God willing, we're going to elect a president that's going to give us our government back, our country back, um, our prosperity back. Um, and the good news, you know, we're, we're already well on this journey. Um, we have growing numbers in Congress that, that get it. Um, that understand what needs to be done, right? Speaker Boehner's resignation is a sign that business as usual, at the very least, has become, you know, uncomfortable. Um, And the bad news (laughs) um, is that uh, while we've changed leadership, we've made little progress in actually reducing uh, the size of the federal government. Uh, And consequently, we're not yet on the road to prosperity, and so uh, if, if smaller government's part of your vision, it's certainly part of my vision, um, you've got you've to cringe every time you see the budgets that come out of the House, out of Congress. You look at that line. You pull up a Heritage website, pull up any, any website you want, and you look at that line of federal spending. You know, we've had, we're now, what, four or five, five, six years into the Tea Party movement. You look at that line, that line is ever sloping upward, right? Um, uh, and the, the worst news is that despite not having actually changed the size and scope of federal government, is that we've divided the Republican Party. Our party is at, you know, we're at war with ourselves. Uh, the elite, um, the establishment Republicans and the grassroots Republicans are at each other's throats. I think everybody can see that. This is um, this not, this not news. Now, there's some hope that the nomination process is going gonna, is gonna to smooth over these divisions and unite the party. Uh, and I, I certainly hope so. Um, but recognizing the depth of the division that exists amongst Republicans in D.C., I, I think we have to, to understand that just nominating somebody is not going to smooth these over. We need to nominate somebody with a plan, with a vision, right, of how we're going to, how we're going to get there. Only a nominee with a clear vision of smaller government, of smaller federal government, uh, and a credible plan to how to get there is going to actually unite the party. Only once we're on this path, I think, will the conflict that we have today within the party um, kind of lead to compromise, right? Because we'll be compromising over something that we we can compromise over instead of having every fight be this existential fight about uh, the size and scope of, of the federal government. I think if we could do that, we'd get back to a point where we could finally um, observe Reagan's 11th 11th commandment that we're now, we're just breaking right and left, right? Thou shalt not attack a fellow Republican. I mean, that's, um, I understand we had to have these fights. I understand we had to have these fights in the party, but we also have to have a vision of how we're going to get to the other side, how we're going to unite the party around um, a, a smaller vision of the federal government. So when we think about this vision, let me start by telling you what the vision's not right? Um, It's not a plan of tax cuts that doesn't address spending. That's not it. Um, It's not a program-by-program description of what we're going to cut. That's not it. Um, It's not a law that says that we're on the path. That doesn't work. Um, And it's not an effort to purify the party. We're not going to elect all just Tea Party guys. That's not going to happen, right? We're not going to have an ideologically pure pure party of true believers. Um, And it's not, and I think this is a big mistake um, some of us make, is it's not just force of will, right? It's not just wanting to do it more. Um, I think think we can only get there um, by changing the incentives. Um, When we, the American people, talk about the system being broken, Right? I think what we're really talking about is the system in ince- of incentives in D.C. are broken. So let me tell you what I mean. Let me, let, me, let me make it very concrete. So imagine that you had a system where you could borrow all the money you want at 1%. You never have to pay it back. And if you have trouble paying it back, you can print more. Okay? That's our system. So, so how much would you spend 
Well, most of the time, it turns out, most of you would spend, spend a lot, like trillions. Like, um, and congressmen, they're people just like you and, and me. Um, I wouldn't trust myself with that system. That's a broken system. You can't fix that system with those incentives. Um, now, Republicans in Congress aren't dumb. They understand it, right? They're living this. Uh, they get the role that the Federal Reserve plays in facilitating government spending. They understand the incentives, and they're sincere. They want to cut. We know that. They know that. They're willing to shut down government to cut its size, right? So why aren't they willing to take on the Federal Reserve? Why is that off limits? If, if They understand the scenario. And it's not like the Fed's delivering prosperity. Republicans can see that. They're on the campaign trail. <clears throat> they see people are struggling. They see this is a jobless recovery, that we have distortions, that we have financial in uh, engineering. They see that all is not well. Um, and it's certainly not that they love Janet Yellen, right? They voted against her in record numbers. You watch the Humphrey Hawkins testimony, the biannual uh, testimony in front of Congress. There's no love lost there. So, so why aren't we doing it? Why is this off the agenda? Well, one word, fear. Um, to be clear, we're not afraid of what happens to our government if we reign in the Federal Reserve. We know it'll get smaller. We're afraid of what happens to our economy if we reign in the Federal Reserve. What happens if the Federal Reserve can't bail us out? So let's be honest. On the one hand, the idea of intervention, government intervention to save over-leveraged banks, right, is anathema to the Republicans that embrace free markets. We don't like bailouts. Bailouts are you know, pull bailouts. It doesn't pull well, right? On the other hand, what would happen to the banking system if the Fed couldn't bail them out? What would happen if the Fed couldn't lend Morgan Stanley $100 billion, right, without asking anybody like they did in the last crisis? Who's going to backstop the $600 trillion in derivatives? Um, and who's going to step in if the Fed can't? This is why. This is why we're afraid to touch the Fed. Not because of what it'll do to the federal government, but because of what it'll do to the private economy. Now, unfortunately, I don't think this fear is misplaced. Uh, the perverse part about all the bailouts that we've had is that they've made our financial system more fragile than ever, right? The solution to too much debt is always more debt, um, which makes the, the next crisis more severe than the last and makes us more dependent upon the Federal Reserve to, to save us again and again. So that, I think that's the situation we're in. So what are our nominees? What are our prospective nominees? What are they going to say, right? Um, where does monetary policy fit in their economic plan? And I think a real leader is not going to ignore this, right? Um, you can't ignore this because if we ignore the monetary system, we're not going to get the federal government on the right trajectory. And if we, if we ignore the monetary system, we're going to continue to favor Wall Street over Main Street. If we ignore the monetary system, the Fed's overreach is only going to get worse. I don't think those are, are really up up for debate, and let's focus on that last point, right? So here we are, we're, we're six years into a, seven, six years into a jobless recovery, seven years of 0% interest rates, um, three rounds of quantitative easing, right? We printed $3 trillion, um, and, and we're having an endless debate about whether or not the economy can handle 25 basis points of rate increases, right? So that is... The system is broken, right? I don't, there's um, not a lot of debate about that. But it's very likely things are going to get worse. If you look at uh, the minutes from the last FOMC meeting, uh, September 17th, they came out and they told us they're not raising rates on September 17th. Uh, and along with that, they released what's called a dot plot. I don't know if you guys saw the dot plot. But there's an amazing thing about the dot plot. Some of those numbers are negative. Right? So some city member of the FOMC is telling us, you know, this hasn't worked so well. So the solution to the problem I now have, right, is that some member of the FOMC is suggesting that we need to start taxing 
people for owning dollars, 25 basis points. Specifically, the Fed fund rate is going to be negative 25 basis points. Now, theoretically, you know, this is really, you know, nothing new. Inflation, money printing, artificially low rates. These are all taxes on average Americans, on working Americans. But these taxes are they're subtle, right? Uh, negative rates, well, negative rates are basically it's not so subtle. Um, so you earn money, you save money, and you save it in your own currency, right? And the Federal Reserve, uh, if you put it in a, a short-term money market with treasuries, takes some of that money away every year, right? Um, and the idea here, right, is not to, um, from the Fed's perspective, why this makes sense. The idea is to punish banks for holding cash, right? They, so this, this is gonna, the idea is this is going to be stimulative. Don't, don't hold all your cash with us, the Federal Reserve. Uh, we're going to charge you for that privilege, so you know, go lend it into the economy. Stimulate the economy. And that's kind of a central planning mindset that you only get from a federal institution that has a a lock-solid monopoly uh, is the purveyor of our money. But for the people, for the American people, we've been shortchanged by the recovery, lost control of our government. The idea of paying the federal government for the privilege of owning our own, holding our own money is, I think is a bridge too far. Um, so we need a nominee, I think, that gets this uh, and doesn't get it in a trivial way, doesn't get it in a, we need a law. Right? We need a law that says we're going to amend the Federal Reserve Act and they can't make interest rates negative, right? Um, this is the wrong way to go about this problem. This is the wrong way to leverage this overreach. Um, statutes aren't the solution, right? We're, incentives are the solution. Um, too big to fail, right? The big reason why we're unwilling to touch the Fed, the big thing that's wrong with our financial system you read the introduction to Dodd-Frank. Don't read the whole thing. I mean, I, I haven't read the whole thing. Just the first paragraph, right? The stated purpose of that legislation is to end bailouts, to end too big to fail. Doesn't do it. I can tell you it doesn't do that. Nobody believes it does that, right? You can patch a statute that says X, Y. That's not the solution. The, the problem is the incentives. The other problem with the statute, statutory uh, strategy, the idea of, moving it from the Fed to Congress or making Congress more responsible. And Emmett said this, Congress can't hold the Federal Reserve to account. I mean, the division of powers at the federal government, this is important. This is an important check. But the real division that's really going to give us back our government is taking those powers out of Washington. So how do we do that? How do we do that with monetary policy? I think we have to subject the Federal Reserve to a little competition. Um, we have to make the market capable of holding the Federal Reserve to account, not Congress. Um, and if they were held to account, they wouldn't be so brazen in abusing their authority. Now, the Constitution, interestingly, um, actually guarantees this right. Article 1, Section 10, right, gives states the right to make gold legal tender. We all have this constitutional right. And the federal government, the IRS, through interpretation, has taken it away from us. Because they tax gold as a collectible. It makes it un, uh, unworkable as a, as a monetary alternative. So there's the Fed. They can do all the central planning they want. They can abuse the monetary system. They can bail everybody out. They can uh, take rates negative, And they know you have nowhere else to go. Well, the solution to the problem is let's return a little of that monetary authority, that monetary sovereignty, back to the people. Let's have a market system that holds them to account. If they behave well, hey, that's great. You know, we're happy to use your currency. But if your currency is good, why do you have to force us to use it, right? The Constitution gives us an alternative. Why not let us use that? And maybe only 1% of us would say on day one, well, gosh, I'm uncomfortable, right? I want something else. And then, God willing, they'd get the, the Federal Reserve would stop abusing its monopoly power, um, the, the federal government would start behaving a little better. We wouldn't promise things that we can't pay for. Um, and everything would be fine. Or maybe they wouldn't get the message. Maybe they'd have to lose just a little bit more of their monopoly before they got the message. But I tell you, you wouldn't have to go very far uh, before they really started to change their behavior. And that, that I think, is really, um, is really federalism. I think what it also um, 
in the presidential context does that I think is particularly interesting is it can be done through executive order, right? So it's the IRS's interpretation, not statute, um, that has given them this overreach to prevent any monetary alternatives circulating here in the, in the U.S., specifically gold. Um, so, um, again, I think a leader needs to take this on. Um, I think we need to see this as part of the economic proposals that are going to come out later this month. Uh, and we simply can't ignore the Federal Reserve, and we need to start changing the incentives uh, to get better behavior out of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Government. We now take you to the end of the event and our interview with Stanley Kurtz from National Review. So regionalism is a great subject for us because we have the Granite State Future. We have uh, nine regional uh, planning, commissions. planning commissions that do all kinds of ill. And, uh, we videotaped a few of these. You've got uh, a panel, a room full of like 30 experts sitting around a table deciding things for which they've never been elected. Do you so. have a grant from the uh, federal grant from the Sustainable Communities Initiative? Yes, here? and it goes through the Nashua uh, Planning Commission mm-hmm. and gets spread out to the other regional commissions. We've been writing about this for years. I see. Not as well as you have at the national level, no, trust but, me. But we we try to go to some uh, of these things. Town by so town important. fights. Town by town fights. Town councils. You go in, they bring in their their, their HUD guy, right. is a Republican, used to be an RNC committee man, we know him. Right. He goes in and pitches the HUD side. We send activists in to, to convince people of the evil, right. <laughs> more or less. And uh, it's a town-by-town fight. We've been pretty good. Right. We've actually won. But it's right. like anything else. When you have federal money behind you, and all of us have regular jobs, we do this as <laughs> we're pa- well past a vocation right. and a hobby. This is an obsession. Right. It's hard to keep the same people motivated because there's so many things coming at us all at the same time. It is overload by design. I agree. And as I, as I was saying in the talk, this new rule, this affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, uh, is going to give the federal government tools to help fight people like you, to help squash you down. It's going to be harder to stop. So, for example, I said in the talk that uh, once a locality has to fill out this incredibly detailed form with where everyone lives in the census tract by race, by ethnicity, uh, by language proficiency, every category you can imagine, and how much access they get to what are called community assets, meaning to high-quality schools, business districts, everything else. If there's any discrepancy, then if you want your federal funding... The feds can say, well, we need you to do something for us. And what might they say you need to do? They might say, you know, we really want you to sign on to the plan being formed by the Sustainable Communities Initiative Group over in Nashua or wherever it is. And that's a lever they're going to use. And they're also going to be more likely to sue. What really happened to Westchester County in New York is that they got sued first by a civil rights organization, then the federal government jumped in and said, you're not affirmatively furthering fair housing because every time that you take federal money, you um, have to sign a promise as a municipality that you will affirmatively further fair housing. So I, I have two questions for you. One, we're rural, mm-hmm. pretty much. Our largest city is only 100,000. Right. We are 98% white. What would they do to New Hampshire? Well, that's, that's a, f- a fabulous question. And, you know, I haven't written enough. I, I've focused on the enough. suburb. You have written tons, <laughs> right. sir. But I haven't written enough about the, the rural, which is what you say. And I can't give a perfect answer, but there are some things I can definitely uh, start to talk about. I did, I did write about um, King County in Washington State. Now, King County in Washington State doesn't exactly have a formal re, uh, urban growth boundary like Portland, but they have something close to it. And the people in the rural areas outside of King County who are trapped in this growth boundary, a lot of them uh, are, depending on their retirement, say, to sell some of their farmland. And they can't do it. Uh, they can't do any kind of development, even if they want to stay on their farm, and I'm not talking about putting in a housing development, I'm talking about just cert- certain kinds of basic improvement that you would want to do on your land. You literally can't improve your own land. So it turns rural people who are in proximity to the growth boundaries into, well, into unfree people who aren't able to own or dispose of uh, their own property. Isn't, couldn't that be taken as a, an illegal taking? 
You would you would think so, and maybe there are lawsuits being planned against it. All I know is that there have been very intense protests by rural people who are just uh, on the rural side and on the wrong side of the growth boundary in King County. And let me say something else, because this is interesting. Now, this isn't exactly rural, but it's, it is about smaller size cities and towns. Um, have you ever heard of Dubuque? Dubuque in Iowa. That is not a very big city. What's actually happening through the Department of Housing and Urban Development is, and, and it all mimics this affirmatively furthering fair housing idea, the uh, Dubuque is having to take public housing tenants from Chicago. And, of course, Dubuque is in Iowa. It's not even in the same <laughs> state. So the federal government is capable of drawing a kind of regional mm-hmm. boundary. And that, so in Dubuque, they originally had categories of who gets a preference, and they would assign points if you get a preference to go into public housing. And they gave most of the preference, understandably, to residents of Dubuque because they pay the taxes. And then they put the next level of preference onto residents of Iowa. And anyone from out of state had the lowest level of preference. Well, the federal government came in and said, well, there's a higher proportion of African Americans from Chicago trying to get into public housing in the larger region. Uh, and therefore, we deem racist your point system. And now you have to take people from Chicago. So if, if the federal government decides that, you know, and I'm afraid I'm going to flunk uh, New England geography here, but if there, even if there are large metropolitan areas that are close to New Hampshire but outside the state and you get pulled into that region, then under Boston. Affirm- mm-hmm. Okay, if they they could because Boston Boston it must be as proximate as Chicago is to Dubuque. It's only an hour. So, yeah. yeah. So theoretically, that's something that could happen here. Wow. The um, I was uh, when you were talking about this a fair housing thing. I started doing some googling and came across HR 2577, which mm-hmm. is the Transportation Housing Urban Development Bill. It was an Appropriation Act. It uh, passed the House with an amendment that would defund that particular thing. But it's, now it's just sitting somewhere in limbo, correct? Yes. Um, Congressman Paul Gosar sponsored an amendment in the House that defunded the affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation and various other parts uh, related material. And Senator Mike Lee <coughs> in the Senate has a similar uh, bill. Um, I wrote about this, and you can Google it. I can't remember all the co-sponsors. It's interesting. One of the co-sponsors of Lee's bill is Rubio. And he's the only presidential candidate I know of mm-hmm. who's jumped in on this issue. I haven't heard him actually talk about it. And so you've got the Lee, uh, you've got the Gosar Amendment, which is passed. You've got the Lee Amendment, which is proposed. But my fear is uh, that if uh, Congress ends up resolving the current budget impasse with a continuing resolution, they don't go back to regular order and actually pass appropriations for particular departments. Uh, this will all go away, and it's possible that there'll be backroom deals in which the Republican leadership says, well, you can have your continuing resolution, but we insist on X, Y, and Z, but frankly, I doubt that they're going to take a stand <laughs> for the Gosar Amendment, unless there's a big public outcry, mm-hmm. which you know I was doing my best to stir, but when you're talking about a continuing resolution for the entire budget, it's likely that... So the truth is, if you want to know what practical thing. Uh, One practical thing is what you're already doing. You're going to these meetings and you're giving them opposition, uh, these planning commissions, and that is so important. But I have to say that another tremendously important thing right now that every municipality should be thinking through is whether they should be taking any money at all from housing and urban development. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very unfair to go and tell someone, well, you shouldn't even take the federal money because municipalities do depend on this. The taxpayers pay their taxes, and they're being, you know, shorted very unfairly. And in the long term, I don't think we can sustain it. But in the short term, if you want to save yourself from this uh, completely overreaching federal control, you better think twice as a municipality about taking that HUD money. I was on Mike Town's budget committee for a couple of cycles. And when I first got in, I went all of us are techies at uh, Granite Rock. So I went through and just reshuffled the, the data just to take a look at you know past budgets and where things were going. And I'm looking around and nobody's using this. Why are we spending money for this? 
oh, this was built 50 years ago with federal money. If we take it down, we have to pay it all back. Exactly what you said before. So I tried to launch ideas of, then why are we taking all this money? And I found all the federal money. And it was just amazing. At the state level, it, it, it's not as big at the small local level as it is at the state, like you mm-hmm. said. But it was amazing on my budget committee. We had 12 members. And Guilford's and it, not that big. No, 7,400 <laughs> people. That's it. But we've got 12, 13 members. It was amazing. People kept saying, it's free money. We have to take this. It's free money. Right, it's really... And I kept saying, look at the strings attached I've exactly. just said. Right. And you guys can't get it through your thick heads. Right. I was not the most political kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm not on the budget anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I tried to wake them up to say, look at the damage it can do. Look at how it constrains your current and your future spending right. like our three hundred thousand dollar sidewalk that goes nowhere now we have to start buying special machinery to keep it free of snow right and you see all you have to do is take one dollar doesn't matter how few people and how little money if you take one dollar then to take it you've got to sign this form that says we agree to affirmatively further fair housing. And since Obama has now defined affirmatively furthering fair housing to mean the federal government gets to tell everybody where they yeah. should live, you are signing over control of your locality. And if you don't do it, even if it's $1, you risk more than just having the feds cut off $1. They could sue you. One of the most exasperating things and probably the most unheralded unheralded Supreme Court decision this past session was th- they called it constitutional. I don't get this. Yes, the disparate impact uh, um, Supreme Court decision in the Texas public housing case uh, really opened the door for this affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation. Now, I think the main reason the Obama administration has waited until the last few months to release this regulation is because it was politically a hot potato, and they kept moving it past every election. And there were thoughts by the housing advocates that would come out even in the first term, kept pushing it back. But I also do believe that part of the reason they waited until uh, they finally did to release it was they were waiting to see what would happen with that housing decision. If the housing decision had gone the other way, and a lot of people expected Justice Kennedy to oppose this disparate, disparate impact idea, The whole affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation would have been something like a dead letter. But with this terrible decision in the Texas public housing case, that opened the door, that green-lighted this tremendously powerful regulation. And people still don't know about it, so they're in danger of applying for the HUD money. And they've got, get this, they've got about a year and a half to go through all the applications and write all of the uh, explanations of their demographics. And then, when does the enforcement start? right after the new president uh, comes in. But can he take that out? Can we see, with the change of, of administration, him going at the very least saying, put that legal document on the shelf, let it collect lots of dust, end of story. Or can he actually break those or start a process to break them? Well, you said he. I was thinking of President Hillary, you see. (laughs) Yeah, there is that. The truth is that a Republican president is the real solution to this. The the weakness of Obama is that he did this. It's just like Senator Cruz said today, you know, live by the pen and the phone and die by the pen and phone. Obama has overreached. This regulation is, is ludicrously outside of his real powers, but he's done it by regulation. So a Republican president gets in. Then we, he, poof, he could just eliminate this whole affirmatively furthering fair housing. We're uh, going to well, have to pack up real soon to get out of here. Okay, so. but One more. will they? And can you get all of these termites that are in the regulatory woodwork, do you think? I think AFFH, this affirmatively furthering thing, can, can and will be stopped by a Republican president. I really believe that. The Democrats have been sheepish about it, actually. They don't like to talk about it because they know that politically it's bad for them. You look at Westchester County. That was a liberal Democratic county in New York, and it flipped over to the Republicans, to Astorino, in significant part because of this issue. And that when they write amongst themselves, they worry that when people really understand what's going on here, I don't, I don't think a Republican president could let this go through, and I think we could, we could uh, raise a groundswell that would make it impossible. I'm very optimistic if a Republican president gets in, but if Hillary gets in, 
she will have the tool that she needs. Um, although Obama's clever, because Obama himself waited to put this in place and start the wheels rolling until all his elections were done and all the Democrats' elections, it would be tough for a Democratic president to enforce this um, sharply. Another thing is that Hillary's uh, often discussed potential vice presidential running mate is uh, Julian Castro, who is the head of HUD. He's the guy in charge of actually enforcing Mm -hmm. this. So it would be very interesting if she ran and picked him, because I think this issue would come right into the heart of the presidential campaign. All right, Stanley Kurtz, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We appreciate thank it. A pleasure, a genuine Alrighty. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Content for this program was edited to fit the time allotted. To hear complete interviews, or if you'd like to hear from the other speakers at the event, like Ted Cruz, Carly Fiorina, and Rick Santorum, just check out GraniteGrock.com.